Lynchburg, Ohio, and then all of a sudden, he wasn't able to walk again for the rest of his life. And so if, if you'll stop out by the table, we got a number of these, feel free to pick some up. I have plenty with me, but uh, this will really encourage you, especially to know that there was a man that put a stick in his mouth, and even though he wasn't able to pastor and preach from a pulpit the rest of his life, his pulpit became a typewriter, and they sent over 5,000 copies of that paper that he wrote for 26 years of his life all over the world. And people got saved even though a man could not even walk, could not even feed himself or take care of himself. He had to sleep in a rocking bed. He had to wear a respirator because he could not breathe on his own. And so it's just a great story. And so my wife wrote this, and I thought this might be interesting to share. And so and the virus, coronavirus has affected all of us. It's affected our ministry the last couple of years. And uh, we were supposed to be in Japan and the Philippines. And that canceled. We were supposed to be in Canada, and that canceled. And so, well, we brought our teams out west. And so, but uh, we had a fundraiser uh, back in April, which uh, Ron Eman, Northwest Baptist Missions, he came out, him and Kathy had come out at that time, and uh, so was our guest speaker. And so uh, we decided to have a, a video that would give a little information about coronavirus. So when this thing starts, it may seem a little sci-fi to you, okay, but it all leads into what MTT Ministry has been doing. So at this time, if uh, Daniel, if you'll go ahead and get that started, then afterwards we have a PowerPoint that I want to go with you too as far as what we did this past summer. <laughs> Ever wonder what the Lord thinks about all this fuss over COVID-19? He's not surprised because Jesus said pestilence would come. He's not powerless to intervene because he's still on the throne. It might take a while longer before the effects of the pandemic go away. So how do we move forward in the meantime? Three years ago, MTT started doing what the Apostle Paul told his son Timothy to do. In the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Boys and girls, we can call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. It says, For whoso shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And I guess that's when it all clicked. Not only that I was a sinner, as Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but also John 3.16. From the beginning, Bob and Joyce Landis were determined to set an example. Timothy, come with me. And we know of many different instances where Paul took Timothy on his missionary journeys. skills and a servant's heart. While ministering in the far-flung corners of the world,
Things were going well until everything shut down. Originally, we planned to go to Japan, the Philippines, and to Canada, and with the COVID going on, we knew that we could not go overseas, and so we felt like there's people out there that need to know the Lord, and so Bob lined up for us to go out west. I appreciate MTT. They have been a real help to us, particularly last summer. We were under the confines of the coronavirus. We weren't sure how uh, we were gonna even be able to do vacation Bible school. And Brother Bob called me and told me what he was up to about bringing a team out west. All week at BBS, we're learning verses, right? You know why we learn verses? They brought the program. George was so thrilled and thankful by their continued generosity. The young people, the materials. To set at liberty none that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Luke 4, 18b through 19. It was just a real godsend to have MTT come out. Young people get saved. Our own teenagers were edified. We were able to run a youth activity. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it. We had MTT come and conduct a vacation Bible school. We had about 10 or 15 children attend each day. But at that moment, one of the housekeepers rushed outside and said, sir, sir, the water heaters are broken. You're the only one who knows how to fix them. Please, will you come in? Last summer, we had MTT Ministry come a second time, right in the middle of COVID-19, lockdown, mask mandates. Well, God blessed in a tremendous way. We saw on any given day at least 50 or more children attend our Vacation Bible School. Many children were saved, and not only that, we gain two new families with children that now attend our church on a regular basis. Even though the Lord's closed the doors last year and this year again, we're still not giving up because the people in Japan said, please come when you can. The same thing in the Philippines. You just take those open doors whenever they do happen. The Landises have the same kind of heart that we have for the Lord, and I trust them implicitly. Uh, I sent my daughter with them to the South Pacific one summer. And it was a great experience for Rachel. and we showed up and it was a much smaller facility and a lot more people and we were scrambling trying to uh, adapt what we had planned to make work 
So it's so encouraging to know that while it may have taken us by surprise, it didn't take God by surprise. And that was God's plan, and we had a wonderful youth rally. I am trusting you. God really brought me to the story of Mary when the angel came to Mary and her response was behold the maidservant of the Lord be it unto me according to thy word and I guess God challenged me just on what would my response be was I going to be like Mary and trust him and just surrender and do what he would have me to do In the early years, Bob would always tell the kids, flexibility is the key. And we're finding out more and more that flexibility is the key for us, too. What kind of identification do you have on a hat like that? I am. Hold on just a second. motor coach has allowed us to be more self-sufficient, more self-contained. It's been a tremendous blessing. I've seen other young people who have traveled on these teams and they come back with an understanding of the ministry that you only get when you're in the ministry. And Bob and Joyce in the formation of MTT Ministries laid a foundation for giving young people an education that they could not get in other ways. So let's focus on the goal and not the destination. Let's ask God to make us sensitive to his leading and then get busy doing what he called us to do. When we're on mission with Jesus Christ, we know the victory will be ours. Just a moment here that uh, he's going to switch some things over and put our PowerPoint off. This past summer, we had the blessing of being able to, we couldn't go overseas again. So we said, well, what are we going to do? So we decided, well, we're going to go back out west again. And so, and there are many, many areas of the west that we I know many pastors that we can get into. And so anyway, we decided to go ahead and bring a team out west. And uh, what a blessing it was. This is the first time in MTT history that I had such a big family. Uh, I had a, a family from Greenville, South Carolina. The, uh, I call him a young man. He's in his early 40s, but he, uh, he and his wife and their children all went on the team. So I had young people anywhere from 17 down to 7. And I'm not used to having a 7-year-old running around, but that's okay. Uh, we made a difference, I believe, in, even in his life. But uh, as they're pulling this PowerPoint up so that we can go ahead and get it going, we'll take a few moments and talk about this. This was about our U.S. Western team that we had. And, of course, you can see uh, the other family that we had, the Hoods, and a number of young people that traveled with us. We started off up in Flandreau, South Dakota with a church planner up there. Uh, and we're so thankful that we had a, a privilege of being able to be there with him. Uh, he wanted us to do his vacation Bible school. Uh, one of the things our ministry is really keen on is trying to train the young people how to teach these lessons. We're trying to prepare a generation that will be willing to step up and do what needs to be done. And uh, here you'll, you'll see here, and for the most part, 
Most of the young people are doing all the different things at the vacation Bible school. You say, why do you do this? Because it's a command. And God tells us to, to be able to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And uh, does it doesn't make any difference how old you are. And here's the youngest. You can see he had five vacation Bible schools he was involved with. But the kids got a chance to earn bucks, and uh, they enjoyed being able to spend those bucks in the store. We traveled west, and we took a day up at Mount Rushmore uh, to pass out some gospel tracts. We were with Pastor Mike and Ariel Clement at Bible Baptist Church in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. And so uh, in our transit of, of being able to go to the next location, uh, we did a youth rally for them at their church. And they were very, very excited about being able to have us come in. Uh, they had a pretty good-sized youth group, and they got involved in a variety of different areas. But once again, the young people were the ones that ran the youth rally. And so, and this is the purpose of Make a Timothy Today. And the Bible says, And the things that thou hast heard of me amongst many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And that's exactly what we're teaching these young people, that they can be involved in a variety of different aspects of ministry, whether it's youth ministries, evangelism, uh, getting out on the door, sharing the gospel. And so, but uh, we took a little, a little time up at the top of the bluff in Nebraska and enjoyed that. Uh, but as we continued to travel west, uh, we saw a lot of unique things. And, uh, but we were on Interstate 80 as we were heading towards Rock Springs, and all of a sudden, that right front tire decided to do a number. And, uh, and it was quite a number, getting the coach off, but we were fortunate that we were able to call someone, and they were able to send a, a repair a man out and uh, a truck that he was able to uh, fix our tire. We had a spare. He was able to get it on. But I had a chance to witness this. This guy was Hebrew, and I had a chance to witness to him while he was there. But uh, we got back on the road again and uh, went to our next location, and uh, we had a service with Pastor uh, Kerry and Marsha Hodge uh, up in uh, Rock Springs, and it was a blessing to be with them. We left from there and went up to be with Jay Sprecher at Friendship Baptist Church. That was right during the 4th of July weekend. And so we did a patriotic service there for Pastor Jay, and they enjoyed uh, our time being able to be with them, even though it was just for a short weekend uh, before we left there and uh, had a chance to go ahead and go do another vacation Bible school. But you can see the young people are involved in so many capacities. They learn how to play hand chimes, and uh, so and they get opportunities to preach and so many other different facets of ministry. There you can see we were with Pastor Doug and Bethany Sondergaard over at Shelley Baptist Church and uh, one of the missionaries that's here right now. And uh, we enjoyed being able to be with them. They were our second vacation Bible school that we did. Now here's James Hood leading the music. And uh, James was a blessing to have him on the team and be able to be involved. One of our young ladies, this young lady right now is in Sac or down in Katy, Texas. And she is uh, actually uh, teaching in a Christian school down there. And, of course, uh, everything that we do, we try to make it exciting for the young people. And uh, you say, did it, did it work out with COVID and everything? You know, I think people have been so cooped up and so told what they can do, what they can't do. And so, and I just like the idea of being able to have good judgment about what we need to do for ourselves. And so, anyway, here you can see the, uh, one of the Hood uh, children was there, and he was leading in some of the uh, activities that was going on. But the kids were, it was just phenomenal. And, you know, some of the vacation Bible schools, sure, they were small churches. But we still had a number of them come. And uh, here you can see Lisa. She's doing a little babysitting there, that little one, uh, the little Asanda guard. Uh, Jim and Janine Dethridge, uh, the great uh, friends of ours that we've known for years. We were uh, there. We left out. We head down to Pinedale, Wyoming. And there we were with Pastor uh, Ted and Teresa York. First Baptist Church is the very first church that Wally Higgins ever planted in the West. And so, and we're excited about being able, that church is a uh, supporting church of ours. And so we uh, stopped off there for about three days and had a, a big youth rally that, uh, once again, our team members conducted. And uh, it was just great to be able to see, uh, you know, uh, another church that was there, uh, sent their young people and got them involved. And, of course, uh, Red Cliff Bible Camp was going on at the time, so it was a little bit smaller. I think we only had about 30 or 40 young people. 
but it was a blessing to be able to be there. This young lady, she's a uh, graduate of Baptist College of Ministry, and uh, so, and this is Luke. Luke is from Delta, Colorado, and uh, Luke, and this was his second trip that he had traveled with MTT, but here you can see a good picture of the team uh, just outside the church. We left from there and went down to be with Pastor Randy and Carrie, uh, uh, David, uh, down at Pear Park, and uh, once again, we were in transition to the next vacation Bible school. And so, and they had about 40 or 50 young people there. So we decided to do a, a, a couple of day youth rally there. And of course, we got involved in their Sunday school and several different things with their church. But uh, it was a joy for them to have an open door for us to come in. And of course, our team always learns puppets. Uh, we use puppets in a lot of different things. But here's one of the girls telling a, a, a Bible story. Uh, on a lesson on Jonah, and uh, so, but the, the kids get a lot of excitement about being able to come up, and, uh, and of course, Lisa on the left there, and Mrs. Hood on the right, Lisa has traveled with us 25 times, and between her and her sister, they've traveled about 40 times uh, with MTT Ministries. We left from there, was down at Garner Mesa Baptist Church in Delta, Colorado with the Hildebrands, and so, and this was our third vacation Bible school that we did this past summer. And we were covering a lot of territory. Uh, probably traveled a distance of roughly about 51, 5,200 miles this past summer uh, between being in South Dakota and then traveling out into Idaho and, and then heading on down into Colorado, New Mexico, and then down into Texas. And so, but God protected us and he kept us on the road. But uh, here you can see, uh, trying to get the young people involved in learning and picking and learning where the scriptures are and uh, learning about what the scriptures are saying to them. And of course, we always have some quizzing uh, at our vacation Bible school. It's good. It keeps them on the cutting edge. We have a new fellow that we introduced to our, our ministry. His name is Oscar. He's the brother of Ollie. And so he's decided to start traveling with us. And, uh, but here you can see Luke is uh, Luke and... Um, uh, and Caleb were actually out involved in some of these different activities that we were doing, really unique. Here you see the young people actually witnessing to somebody along the street uh, as they were out and we were knocking on doors and passing out flyers and uh, just trying to get the gospel out to people that needed to hear. Now, my wife has been writing dramas every year for a number of years about different missionaries. And here you can see our team is actually acting out uh, the life story of Isabel Kuhn. And of course, uh, afterwards, we always have the preaching, and so drama isn't going to be the main focus, but uh, it is part of what we do, and so the young people can learn a lot about the missionaries themselves. And you see we have a little R&R &R time there, relaxing. And so, but we left from there after our third vacation Bible school and was with Mike and Elizabeth Kleberger uh, down at Emmanuel Baptist Church. Now, if you'll look here and notice... Uh, James is actually uh, teaching the teen and young adult class, Vacation Bible School. We structure it a little bit different because they are a little older, but they get involved in a variety of things. One of the things I like about Pastor Mike is uh, this man has been at this church for a long, long time. And if you'll notice the young people that are here, these young people are Native American. Okay, they're from the Navajo tribe. And so, and it was really quite interesting to know that Pastor Mike's congregation is made up of about between 80 and 90 percent uh, Navajo. And uh, so we had a chance to minister with those folks there. We left from there, and then we headed south to be with Pastor Greg and Teresa Kelly at Faith Baptist Church in Saxe, Texas. This was our fifth and last vacation Bible school for the summer. And so it was, uh, it was quite warm down there, but uh, we enjoyed being able to be there with them. It was our first time ever to do a vacation Bible school in Texas. And we see right now the Lord is beginning to open up some other doors for us to go into Texas, several other locations. And so, but uh, we just had a grand time being able to, to give the gospel out there. Uh, there were at least 10 or more young people and some adults that trusted Christ as their Savior while we were out this summer. Some of these young people you see here had a chance to open their Bible, maybe for the first time, and actually lead somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ. So MTT is still doing what we've always been doing. Uh, what we do is not broke, and so uh, we took a little time and took the young people to the George Bush Presidential Library, 
uh, we were close by there in Dallas, and so we decided we wanted the young people to be able to see a little bit of history there. And so, uh, but you know, when you're doing what you know God wants you to do, you don't look back. You just keep going forward. COVID has changed things. But we've been doing this going on 24 years, and we thank God for people that have been supporting the ministry. And we thank God for this church. Uh, we thank God for what he's done here. Uh, I stand amazed, and I remember when this church was in their old facility uh, that they had a number of years ago, and uh, I remember how everyone were so faithful here in being able to do what they needed to do to get the gospel out. You know, it is our responsibility to... I call that lights. And so, but anyway, I, I want to take just the remaining time. I was told I had till 10.15. I'm going to try to preach a short message here, but it's something that is relevant to all of us. If you take your Bibles and open them up to Psalms chapter 37 this morning. Psalms chapter 37, we're going to look at three verses. Uh, verse 3, 4, and 5, and I want to make some practical applications here this morning that I think is relevant and that all of us could put to practice. So Psalms chapter 37, uh, verses 3 through 5, uh, it reads, Trust in the Lord, and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for the church. I thank you for this body of believers that's here this morning. Lord, I thank you for these young people that are here. Because, God, I know that that is the next generation to carry the gospel around the world. God, I just ask you that you'll help us to see something from this passage of Scripture. And Lord, may we apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I want to look at something very, very important. It's something that most of you can relate to. And it's a word that all of us know of. And it's a word that is actually in Scriptures this morning. It's titled, What is Commitment? Commitment. All of us know that word. All of us know what it means to be committed. And what is commitment? Well, commitment is a pledge. It's an agreement to do something in the future. Without commitment, contracts are broken. Marriages are dissolved. Wars are lost. Children are abandoned. Buildings are not completed. Bills are not paid. Jobs are terminated. Discipleship is non-existent in the government not taken to those that are without commitment. And this morning, I want to show you three things that commitment will do. In Proverbs 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. We see here in verse 3, it talks about trust. We see, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. What does that really mean? It means to have total dependence upon God. Now, the unsaved world cannot have that. But you, as a Christian, can have total dependence upon God. And that's what it means to trust in the Lord with all your heart. But then he says, and lean not upon thine own understanding. What does that mean? That means don't rely upon yourself. Oh, yes. How often do we do everything because we rely upon what we know we can do? But that's not what the Scripture says. He tells us not to rely upon ourselves. He tells us not to lean upon your own understanding. Why? Because our own understanding may not be His ways. The Bible says His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And then we see it says, in all is acknowledge him. What does that mean? It means to keep Christ first. That's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians, keeping Christ first. When I have young people in, I keep young people Christ-centered, Christ-focused, looking upon what God may possibly have for them in their life. 
And then finally, in Proverbs, he says, and he will direct thy paths. That means we ought to just accept his guidance. Whatever God has for us, we don't know what it is. You know, it hasn't been too long ago, even within a week, that there's been a death in this, fam uh, in this church family. You know, accepting what God has. We don't understand. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. But he tells us to accept. His guidance, he says, he would direct our paths. So number one, we see that three, it will do to trust. Number two, something else it will do, according to uh, verse four, it says, it will cause you to delight. It will cause you. Uh, take your Bibles and look at chapter 40, please, if you please. Psalms chapter 40. And if you will look and see at verse 8, look what it says. David says, I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. David delights to do the will of God. He says, thy law is within my heart. You know something? You'll want to serve God and do something for God. What well, you delight in the Lord? That's right. You'll want to have full service to him. Look over to Numbers chapter 14, if you please. Numbers chapter 14. And we are going rather quickly here, but I want to make sure that everyone gets points and sees what we're looking at. In Numbers chapter 14, this not only works in what we should be doing, but look what happens from Almighty, from God himself. In verse 8 of chapter 14 of Numbers, it says, If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into a land and give it us, a land that floweth with milk and honey. You know something? When you're doing what God wants you to do, God delights in that. You know, many times we're going the opposite direction of what God wants us to do. Do you think that makes God happy? I don't think so. But the Bible tells me that he will delight in us. And so how will he delight in us? Well, he'll delight in us when we seek to do his will, when we seek to serve him, when we seek to be whatever he has for each and every one of us. So number two, it will cause you, commitment will cause you to delight. Let's look at the third point. And this is the last point. Look, if you please, over to Mark, if you look at Mark chapter 1, another prime illustration of what commitment will do. Mark chapter 1 and verse 40 and 41. Now keep in mind, just the verse before this, this tells the story that Jesus has been in Galilee and he's been preaching throughout Galilee. He's been casting out devils and doing a number of things. And so, and it says in verse 40, then there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, can thou make me clean? And in verse 41, Jesus says, Moved with compassion, he put forth his hands, and he touched him, and he said unto him, I will. Be thou clean. You say, why is that important? Well, the Bible says as soon as Jesus touched him, the next verse down, it says that the leprosy had departed from him. You see, Jesus cleansed that man from his problem that he had. You know, many of us have problems. Do we go to the Lord? Do we seek the Lord? The third point of com commitment is this. Commitment will cause you to move. Young people, when you're sold out to God, commitment will cause you to go on a mission trip. It'll cause you to go on to college. It'll cause you to want to go on and serve God. Not only in this verse, but if you look down at chapter 2, there's another story. In the first few verses, for the sake of time, I won't read it all, but it talks about a man that was sick of the palsy. You see, Jesus had been in Capernaum. And as he was there and he was preaching, he was in a house, 
There was a lot of people around. The Bible talks about there were four people that brought that man that was sick of the palsy. They brought him to see Jesus. But they couldn't get to him. So they go up in the roof, and they open the roof up, and they let that man sick of the palsy down to where he was there before Jesus. We know the rest of the story. The Bible says that when that happened, Jesus healed that man. Third point, commitment. You see, not only was the leper committed to go to Jesus, but there were four men in the life of a leper that were committed to move. And that is what commitment will do. It will cause you to move. It will cause you to do something. Now, might I say, people say that they're committed to do different things. I've been doing MTT ministries going on for 24 years. I have talked to thousands of people. I have had hundreds of people have traveled with MTT ministries. But there are many that have talked about it, and that's as far as it went. Because, you see, they weren't committed. They didn't trust. They didn't delight in what God had for them. And they didn't move when they had the opportunity. I don't get them all. You know, my wife and I travel thousands of miles all the time trying to find just a few to be able to travel with us to go give the gospel around the world. You know, the pathway to hell is paved with good intentions. But intentions are not commitments. You know, when you start speaking about being committed, that's when people begin to wonder, okay, okay, commitment. I know what this means. Okay, I see what I'm supposed to do here now. Oh, yeah. Commitment means it's time to move. But intentions are not commitments. You see, the pathway to hell is paved with good intentions. And there's a lot of people that's going to wake up in hell. And even though they had good intentions, they weren't committed to the Savior. They weren't committed to trust Christ as their Savior. I try to get young people to realize, hey, listen, you're the one that's got to take the gospel to these people. Don't worry about what somebody else is doing. You take it. You go with the gospel. You let God use you in whatever way that you can possibly do. Moms and dads, how about you? We're not a generation of commitments, but rather loopholes. And we're often committed to the idea, but not the task. You say, well, do you take older people? Yes, I do. You saw the death regions a little bit ago. Jim and Janine are in their mid-70s. They've traveled on three different mission teams with me. If your health is good enough to go, I'll take you. The Bible says, mine eye affecteth my heart. And almost every missionary that's out here that has ever done anything for God will tell you that their eye has affected their heart because they have seen through their eyes what God needs for them to do. You know, when you leave here today, you need to remember it's not about what you're going to get out of God. But my friend, what is God going to get out of you? How much can God get out of you? I wish we could understand, which we can, how God feels about when we have had many opportunities laid before us and we have fallen short of accomplishing his will for our lives. Let me finish by saying this this morning. Is God going to get, or is God getting the best return on his investment in your life? 
What a profound statement. You're here this morning. You hear about what God is doing. But ask yourself that question. Young people, ask yourself that question. Is God getting the best return on his investment on your life? Do you give the gospel out? I mentioned this gospel tract this morning. There was a man by the name of Art Gordon. And all I can tell you is, even though he was paralyzed from the neck down because of polio, this man knew what commitment was all about. Because with a stick in his mouth and an electric typewriter, one letter at a time, he typed a newsletter for 26 years of his life until he died. I encourage you to get this track. There's a blog on the back of it. My wife and her brothers are putting on every single newsletter that he ever typed with a stick in his mouth. What was different? Was he so special? Art Gordon was committed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, what is commitment? We just looked at all this. It means to trust. It means to delight. And it means church folk here would be willing to move and do something. Lord, this church can use more help. God, may we be willing to help. In Jesus' name, amen. Please come and see us at the table. We'll be glad to talk to you. We're doing sign-ups. We're glad if you come by and shake my hand, and sometimes that's a bad thing to say, but if you come by and shake my hands, you may end up in a different country someplace. Thank you. God bless.